the man from Ironbark. It was the man from Ironbark who struck the Sydney town. He wandered over street and park. He wandered up and down. He loitered here, he loitered there, till he was like to drop. Until at last, in sheer despair, he sought a barber shop. Here, shave my beard and whiskers off. I'll be a man of mark. I'll go and do the Sydney top, up home in Ironbark. The barber man was small and flash, as barbers mostly are. He wore a strike your fancy sash. He smoked a huge cigar. He was a humorist of note and keen at repartee. He laid the odds and kept a tote, whatever that may be. And when he saw our friend arrive, he whispered, Here's a lark. Just watch me catch him all alive, this man from Ironbark. There were some gilded youths that sat along the barber's wall. Their eyes were dull. Their heads were flat. They had no brains at all. To them, the barber passed a wink, his dexter eyelid shut. I'll make this bloomin' yokel think his bloomin' throat is cut. And as he soaked and rubbed it in, he made a rude remark. I suppose the flat is pretty green up there in Ironbark. A grunt <coughs> was all reply he got. He shaved the bushman's hmm. chin, then made the water boiling hot and dipped the razor in. He raised his hand. His brow grew black. He paused a while to gloat. Then flashed the red-hot razor back across his victim's throat. Upon the newly shaven skin, it made a livid mark. No doubt, it fairly took him in, the man from Ironbark. He fetched a wild upcountry yell. <laughs> Might wake the dead to hear. And though his throat he knew full well was cut from ear to ear, he struggled gamely to his feet and faced the murderous foe. You've done for me, you dog. I'm beat. One hit before I go. I only wish I had a knife, you blessed murdering shark. But you'll remember all your life the man from Ironbark. He lifted up his hairy paw. With one tremendous clout, he landed on the barber's jaw and knocked the barber out. He set to work with nail and tooth. He made the place a wreck. He grabbed the nearest gilded youth and tried to break his neck. And all the while his throat he held to save his vital spark and murder, bloody murder, yelled the man from Ironbark. A peeler who had heard the din came in to see the show. He tried to run the bushman in, but he refused to go. And when, at last, the barber spoke and said, "'Twas all in fun. It was just a little harmless joke, a trifle overdone. A joke? He cried. By George, that's fine. A lively sort of lark. I'd like to catch that murdering swine some night in Ironbark. And now, while we're on the shearing floor, the listening shearers gape. He tells the story, oh and o'er, oh, and brags of his escape. Then barber chaps what keeps a toe. By George, I've had enough. One tried to cut my bloom and throat, but thank the Lord it's tough. And whether he's believed or no, there's one thing to remark. The that flowing beards are all the go, go way, way up in Iron Bark. <laughs> Who's doing the dishes? And it's written by me. We have a medical mystery that has stumped our family physician. Our children all seem to be afflicted with this recurring condition. We have tried different foods, as recommended by a dietitian, and consulted a French professor, the world's leading paediatrician. But still, no one can solve the mystery of what happens after we eat. Our children seem quite normal until we mention that dinner's not complete until the dishwasher's packed, the table's wiped, and the kitchen is all done. That is the moment when this strange sickness overcomes every single one. The disorder takes a number of forms and changes every single night, which is why I'm guessing it is so hard to solve our unhappy plight. The first symptom is predictable. Someone's busting to go to the loo, although they never seem quite sure if they need to do a wee or a poo. One daughter says, I need more food. To satisfy her growing appetite, surely as good parents, we wouldn't want her to be hungry through the night. Our youngest daughter falls asleep at the table. 
to help digest her food, we dare not risk waking her and, and experiencing her life-deprived mood. But still the problems continue, with apparently the teacher to blame. My teacher said I had to finish my homework. I hear one child exclaim, sweaty armpits is the next culprit, as I hear another call, shower. The perspiration must have been bad, we don't see her for the next hour. My son starts sweating and convulsing. His vital signs start to diminish. Please, take me to my video game. I just have this level to finish. Now that takes care of the most common symptoms, but still they come up with others. My daughter wants to upload a selfie so her friends can show their brothers. My favourite TV show is on. I wouldn't dare think of missing it. Next, there is a disaster to manage. The emergence of a big zit. A glass of milk helps my growing bones. I need to take the dogs for a run. I have heard that it is important for kids to relax and have some fun. They have been quite creative, with more excuses than a politician. The kitchen is now deserted. They have vanished faster than, than a magician. This scene is repeated every night. I'm not sure if my wife can cope. First, one legitimate excuse has now led us down this slippery slope. I wonder how this developed. Is it learned or is it genetic? I think we need more research on this, or am I just being pathetic? At least my husband will help, says my wife. Otherwise, I'll be here all night. Uh, I'll be back in a minute, I promise. I just have this poem to write. Little Red Riding Hood And the Wolf By, by Roald Dahl As soon as Wolf began to feel That I would like a decent meal I went and knocked on Grandma's door. When Grandma opened it, she saw the sharp white teeth, the horrid grin, and Wolfie said, May I come in? Poor well, Grandmama was terrified. He's gonna eat me up! She cried, and she was absolutely right. He ate her up in one big bite. But Grandmama was small and tough, and Wolfie wailed, That's not enough! I haven't yet begun to feel that I have had a decent meal. He ran around the kitchen yelping. I've got to have a second helping. Then added with a frightful leer. I'm therefore going to wait right here till little Miss Red Riding Hood comes home from walking in the wood. He quickly put on Grandma's clothes. Of course I hadn't eaten those. I dressed myself in coat and hat. I put on shoes and after that I even brushed and curled my hair. Then sat myself in Grandma's chair. In came the little girl in red. She stopped. She stared. And then she said, What great big ears you have, Grandma. All the better to hear you with. The wolf replied. What great big eyes you have, Grandma. Said Little Red Riding Hood. All the better to see you with. The wolf replied. He sat there, watching her and smiled. He thought, I'm going to eat this child. Compared with her old grandmama, she's going to taste like caviar. Then Little Red Riding Hood said, But Grandma, what a lovely, great, big, fairy coat you have on. Well, that's wrong, cried Wolf. Have you forgot to tell me what big teeth I've got? Ah, well, no matter what you say, I'm going to eat you anyway. The small girl smiles. One eyelid flickers. She whips a pistol from her knickers. She aims it at the creature's head, and bang, 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 she shoots him dead. A few weeks later, in the wood, I came across Miss Riding Hood. But what a change, no cloak of red, no silly hood upon her head. She said, hello, and do please note, my lovely furry wolfskin coat. Good job. The Jibung Polo Club by Banjo Patterson. It was somewhere up the country, in a land of rock and scrub, that they formed an institution called the Jibung Polo Club. They were long and wiry natives from the rugged mountainside, and the horse was never saddled that the Jibungs couldn't ride. But their style of playing polo was irregular and rash. They had mighty little, uh, mighty little style, but a mighty lot of dash, and they played on mountain ponies that were muscular and strong though their coats were quite unpolished and their manes and tails were long. And they used to train those ponies, wheeling cattle in the scrub. They were demons, were the members of the Jibung Polo Club. It was somewhere down the country, in a city's smoke and steam, that a polo club existed called the Cuff and Collar Team. As a social institution, it was a marvellous success, 
for the members were distinguished by exclusiveness and dress. They had natty little ponies that were nice and smooth and sleek, for their cultivated owners only rode them once a week. So they started up the country in pursuit of sport and fame, for they meant to show the G-bungs how they ought to play the game. And they took their valets with them just to give their boots a rub. Here they started operations on the G-bung Polo Club. Now, my readers can imagine how the contest ebbs and flows. When the G-bung boys got going, it was time to clear the road. And the game was so terrific that here after time was gone, a spectator's leg was broken just from merely looking on. For they waddied one another till the plane was strewn with dead. While the score was kept so even that they neither got ahead. And the cuff and collar captain, when he tumbled off to die, was the last surviving player. So the game was called a tie. Then the captain of the G-Bungs raised him slowly from the ground. Though his wounds were mostly mortal, yet he fiercely gazed around. There was no one to oppose him. All the rest were in a trance. So he scrambled on his pony for his last expiring chance. For he meant to make an effort to get victory to his side. So he struck a goal and missed it. Then he tumbled off and died. By the old Campaspe River, where the breezes shake the grass, there's a row of little gravestones that the stockmen never pass. For they bear a crude inscription saying, Stranger, drop a tear. For the cuff and collar players and the G-bung boys lie here. And on misty, moonlit evenings, while the dingoes howl around, you can see their shadows flitting down that phantom polo ground. You can hear the loud collisions as the flying players meet, and the rattle of the mallets and the rush of ponies' feet, till the terrified spectator rides like blazers to the pub. He's been haunted by the spectres of the Jibang Polo Club. Tomorrow's smartphone user, and it's written by me. I have myself a new smartphone. It does most everything. The device has features that would be fit for any king. Like an instant message, email, text and SMS. I could probably do them all at the same time, I guess. I can browse the internet, see all the latest news, use a tracking device to check on my pet kangaroos. I can download an app to do anything I want. View my heart rate, my banking, or the weather in Vermont. I can open up Facebook, Flickr, MySpace, and Vivo. These names would mean nothing only a few short years ago. I can play my best music with a flick of the touchscreen while taking photos and uploading my favorite scene. I was using it one day when I heard a strange ring ring. Never before had I heard this. It was such a strange thing. In some confusion, I looked at my email and apps. Was this some new feature I wasn't aware of, perhaps? I bumped a green button, then I heard a familiar sound. It was a voice I knew too well, a woman well-renowned. How could I possibly hear it? Where was it coming from? I looked for the answer on wikipedia.com. Then a strange thing happened. I held the device near my ear and I could hear my mum's voice coming through so very clear. I didn't know what was happening. How could I hear mum? Was she somehow trapped in this device? What had she become? Then my mum explained everything. This gadget was a phone. I had once heard about them, but to me they were unknown. Imagine a device that I just hold in my right hand that allows me to talk to a friend in a foreign land. I must tell all I know about this classic invention. I'll post on my wall and tweet for extra attention. Now that I can talk to people and know I'm not alone, I wonder if I need features, or maybe just a phone. <laughs>